New World next week. I'm James Corbett at CorbettReport.com. And I'm James M. Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. We can defeat the fang. We've got that story plus some attractive research. But first, the collapse of traditional TV continues with streaming close behind. The Wall Street Journal reports that more than one million customers canceled their cable TV or satellite subscriptions over the last quarter, just the last few months, marking one of the largest seasonal drops ever. This ratchets up the pressure on traditional pay TV providers to find new ways to generate revenue, and it continues to shine a focus on streaming services and what they call skinny content bundles, which is basically sort of the bare essentials. You know, just the channels you want, kind of like people have wished for probably decades. Skinny content bundles being offered by traditional cable companies. Wall Street Journal arrived at the same conclusions that Zero Head it did, and it's one the tactics of traditional cable companies to try and get consumers to, stu- to switch to their streaming services are not helping stop the erosion of business and, in fact, may actually be making it worse. Companies like Verizon and AT&T have seen their pay TV customers fall off at the quickest rate in recent years, even though they had the smallest subscriber bases to begin with. Overall, it's actually places like DirecTV and Dish that have lost the most customers. Those kind of places are the most vulnerable because they don't even offer internet access like some of those other places do. And as is noted in this article, internet is, of course, still in demand. So they kind of leave it off with a question. Is it one, maybe the unthinkable scenario of what they call super saturation? which I think we've been at for several, several years, just sort of peak TV where there's 20 different shows you just have to watch, and it's been that way for now far too long. Or is it that people uh, have too much debt and actually just want to cut back and take care of their budget a little bit? We'll include the poll and the graphs and the charts and all that good stuff in the show notes. Outlook for traditional TV goes from bad to worse. James, if we covered this story before, this might be a continuing installment in the death of TV. Yeah, I think we cover this every year or two. Um, and we <laughs> talk about the different uh, declining numbers for dinosaur media. And it is part of a trend that is happening. It's just it just is a phenomenon. This is not, it it can say many different things, because as you say, there's a confluence of reasons for which people are cutting their cords. And that could be simply budget reasons. It could be simply because, well, now they have so many different choices online, why would they need the cable or whatever it is. Um, But it just occurred to me as you were speaking, I never actually really thought of this before. But I've been a cord never, basically, since I moved out of my parents' home. Uh, When I moved to Dublin, uh, I didn't have cable and didn't watch TV and didn't really care. And then when I moved to Japan, same thing. Never had, I had a, I had a TV in like our roommate shared apartment, but didn't, didn't buy cable for it. And since then, I've just never had, I don't, don't watch TV at all. So I haven't watched TV for 15, 16 years, basically. And it's never even really occurred to me <laughs> that I've been a cord never. <laughs> so uh, that just goes to show the state of, I think, the way that the media landscape has changed, that I've just basically existed online for the last 12 years or so. Even before that point, all I was doing was going to the caf- the internet cafe and just checking my email on a once every few days basis. So I really haven't been in touch for a long time. And uh, <laughs> I feel okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how other people feel about this, but I think this is just a phenomenon. So this is probably the type of thing that for people over a certain age is probably crazy and unthinkable, but for people under a certain age, I don't know, who would buy a cable package and why? Well, I might be right in right in that sort of in-between spot. I think probably the last time the last time I've had cable and I don't even think it was legal. We just sort of got it, the apartment place we lived in. Someone paid for it and the three other buildings got it. That's um, that's been 20 years ago. It's just been nothing but Internet since then. So speaking of Internet and maybe a little bit of actually kind of context and subtext, I think it kind of goes along with this first story. We'll include as related another poll. Americans turning against social media, and this is it goes all out of proportion, most think it hurts democracy, mm. and Facebook and Twitter are hurting democracy, and it's pretty much up in all the numbers that they've looked at when they asked this question last year. Exclusive poll, America sours on social media giants. 
which I think kind of transitions us perfectly into segment number two on this New World Next Week, episode 357 for a thankful Thanksgiving week. At least it's Thanksgiving here in the States. Tex Fang stocks lost over one trillion dollars amid the current tech route. The five FANG stocks collectively lost more than a trillion dollars in market value from recent highs. This was kind of going down Monday, Tuesday. The FANG, if you don't know, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, aka Alphabet Incorporated, they all began the week all trading lower. Apple led the losses, falling 4.8%. Of course, like a lot of these things, once the day goes on and the days go on and the week a little bit more, there is the update. U.S. markets rebound after FANG plunge. I don't think that means they all made back a trillion dollars that they lost. Because, of course, you know, whether it's grade point averages or money, it's really easy to plummet. It takes a little bit more time to kind of build your way back up, James. So we go from the cord cutting to the FANG. How are you doing on the FANG? Well, uh, the, uh, as people who read my editorials know, I don't put much stock in the stock market, but um, but it it can be a bellwether for public opinion on certain things, and I think that's partially what's being reflected here. As you say, people are exiting social media en masse at this point because of all of the crap that's swirling around it, and some of it is... As you say, the, uh, oh no, it's democracy. Oh, they, they're interfering with the elections and all of that kind of stuff. Other people are seeing it for what it is, which is political censorship and are choosing not to put their time and invest their their lives into social media platforms that they don't own control or have any say over it in, in any way that can be deleted on, at the snap of Jack's fingers or Zuck's fingers or whoever it is. And so people are starting to wake up to that. And hopefully... That indicates some sort of ex meaningful exodus. If this is just a, oh, we're just going to hold out until some new platform comes along that does all the same stuff, but looks, you know, glitzier and is kind of, you know, cooler than than the old, uh, you know, Facebook, that's for grandpas. <laughs> I mean, we need something new. So if it's just a uh, churning into something new, uh, the, the same old, same old, then who cares? But potentially this is a meaningful exodus. That's that's the story of this stock plunge that I want to take out of it. But even the stock plunge narrative is a narrative that's constructed because this is based off of their falling from their 52-week highs. This isn't like they lost a trillion dollars in a week kind of thing. So uh, there's a lot of different ways you can look at these phony baloney numbers. And always remember that the stock market is manipulated and rigged seven ways from Sunday. And if you need another example of that, I just wrote about it last weekend in the uh, forecaster editorial about the flash crash and the new SEC supercomputer that's going to database and log every transaction in real time so they can prevent a flash crash, except they launched the whole $50 million, whatever it is, system, and it doesn't quite work. <laughs> so you can read all about that in my latest editorial. But uh, yeah, uh, it's a potentially hopeful story, depending what people do with this. Yes, you can get mad at the social media platforms that are censoring and doing all this stupid stuff, but if you don't make a meaningful change, then what's it going to amount to? Well, and there are a bunch of other stories about that, you know, now the investors want Zuckerberg out there embroiled in some latest controversy of some other third party group that they're working with. But I wouldn't be surprised, of course, you know, they'll chop off the head so that the board members can go forward and continue to do what they do without so much icky bad press and bad PR. And I bet a bunch of stuff will also tie in, of course. I know we just finished with the 2018 midterm selections in the States, but a bunch of this social media junk is going to tie in, of course, with the 2020 big presidential selection race. James, as you're kind of talking about flash crashes, I just noted this past week on my morning show, I always like to do this day in history notes. And one of them was about the plunge protection team. So we were talking about that quite literally a decade ago. Our final story on this New World Next Week is kind of a roundup of stories, a roundup of interesting research. James, scientists develop liquid that can store energy for over a decade. I guess one of the main problems with solar panels is they can't really hold a lot of energy and store it for a long time. The PDF, the actual research, macroscopic heat release in a molecular solar thermal energy storage system 
Any thoughts on that one? <laughs> uh, well, I'll believe it when I see it. This is obviously an exceptionally important part of the whole paradigm because you, if you can't store the energy, then what's the, I mean, it's it's almost useless. It's a cloudy day suddenly eliminates uh, solar power. So we need this type of storage device, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing this applied in reality. Research the second study shows treatment could end peanut allergies, possibly. The PDF oral immunotherapy for peanut allergies. James, I know it's a lot of those kind of situations where we don't like to look actually at the causes of all of these allergies, but they look like they maybe have an actual end to the peanut allergy. Thoughts on that one? Well, again, uh, you know, I hope it's true, um, but let's not just sit there and hope for it. Um, uh, we, uh, yeah, I mean, causes is the more important thing. And of course, one of the things they found is that people's keeping peanuts away from children for years because they could have a peanut allergy is part of what's giving people peanut allergies. So think, keep that in mind. And so, yeah, sort of the classic sort of overuse of antibiotics or, oh, I use this hand sanitizer so much I can't come in contact with any germs because my body can't deal with it anymore. James, I know we're just really beating around the bush here. The real research worth talking about. Study says men with beards are more attractive. A new study shows men who have full beards are more attractive than men who are clean shaven. Do not doubt me. This study was published in the Journal of Evolutionary Biology. Researchers asked more than 8,500 women to rate men on their attractiveness as a long-term romantic partner. The They rated it as number one, the most desirable heavy stubble. Ten days coming in, the close second is full beards. Then lower on the list, light stubble. At number four, the bottom of the attractive list, clean shaven. Beards may be more attractive to women when considering long-term than short-term relationships as they indicate a male's ability to successfully compete socially with other males for resources. Beards, the researchers said, are associated with a man's age and masculine social dominance. The PDF, all of these actually are not behind the paywall, fortunately. The masculinity paradox. Facial masculinity and beardedness interact to determine women's ratings of men's facial attractiveness. James, I'll just throw you right out there and note that you found this one. <laughs> I did indeed. Well, I, I mean, the science has spoken. Science is settled. And I've heard there's a 97% consensus among scientists on this. So you, if you question it, you are a science-denying quack, a conspiracy theorist. It is settled. So, you know, sorry to anyone who disagrees, but it's just, it's been proven. All right. I think that's a fantastic way to start to wrap up this Thanksgiving week edition of sort of looking at good news as best we can. It is difficult to find good news, as we were joking a little bit before we started to tape. It's hard to find good news, especially twice in one week, because I actually put together a Good News Next Week episode, 3D Printing Prosthetic Limbs for Free. It's also got stories about free little libraries finally reaching the American Southwest and some good news about nature-based imagery. So I am actually back on the air the week after this Thanksgiving holiday, streaming my news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, James. And let's turn this back around to the people out there, because we all, I'm sure you and I, I know I get flooded with people sending all sorts of stories, but not a lot of good news stories, not ones that you could chalk up in that category. So if you do have any out there, please don't hesitate to send them in. We're always looking for ways to highlight solutions and ways that we're winning. And on that note, we're going to leave it there for this week. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to all my American brethren, bearded or otherwise. Uh, have a good, uh, have a good weekend, James. All right, buddy. Thanks. Take care.